This podcast is brought to you by Midwinter. These guys were a startup, an entrepreneurial startup some 10 years ago, way before it was even cool to be a tech startup, and have since then gone on to win every single award year after year after year when it comes to financial advice software. I use them. Um, I know a lot of people that have, and if you haven't already jumped onto the new way of doing business, which is all cloud-based and API, so it all talks to each other, then go look at yourself in the mirror and sort yourself out and go get Midwinter. Cool. So today we're going to talk a bit about Sam's business and uh, Sam's got, got a, for those that don't know, he's, he's got a spot on the um, Sky business uh, each week where he talks about uh, money and all things sort of finance related. Um, so we're going to talk a bit about that and, and then we'll talk a bit about his journey around um, practice of the year. For anyone that's watching in that uh, that is new to the XY Live, there's a chat box on the on the side there, and if you just uh, set your chat to um, the settings to type to everyone, then everyone will be able to see what you're typing. Um, as we're going through the session, if you've got any questions, feel free to type them into the chat box, uh, and we're going to get to to some audience questions towards the the end of the session. Um, also, guys, just uh, for those watching, I've just put a link up to next week's session um, as well in the chat box. So, Sam, so t tell us, I suppose, first of all, give us a bit of your background um, and, and tell us a little bit about how your journey to, to get to this point and the whole um, TV thing and, and, and uh, we'll talk a bit more detail about the practice of the year, but um, sort of uh, to give people an understanding of who you work with and how you do it? Yeah, sure. Listen, I, uh, I started off working in a family business many years ago uh, after I left school. But uh, when I left school, I went straight to uni and I failed uni. I got booted out after uh, going skiing too much. I was competing in mogul competitions up at Mount Buller, just out of Victoria. And I uh, prioritised that well over my university career at that point in time. As, a, as an 18-year-old leaving university, I didn't particularly feel that accounting was for me. So uh, I dropped out for a few years, went and worked in the family business, travelled and did uh, you know, a few crazy things. And uh, went back to uni when I was, when I was about 26. And uh, I studied accounting, did a double degree in accounting and financial planning. And, uh, you know, I went from, uh, from zero to HDs in no time at all when you're paying for it for yourself and you're uh, using your own time and driving an hour and a half out to the University of Western Sydney from the Northern Beaches, uh, your motivation starts to go through the roof. So for that reason, I uh, uh, did fairly well at university and uh, then went into financial planning after renovating a bunch of properties in Sydney. And then just trying to find good advice. I was, I was trying to get a good financial advisor and I, I just couldn't find one. I couldn't find someone that would give me advice on tax, on property and on, uh, on, um, uh, on shares. And it was, it was fascinating that I couldn't find someone in the financial advice industry that could help. And I went to you know, a bunch of banks and all the usual places and thought, hey, rather than seeing this as a negative, I might see this as a bit of an opportunity. Having studied accounting and also studied financial planning, um, you know, I'd obviously developed a bit of an interest in financial planning. I thought that I might go down that path. And you know, I started to uh, gain a few clients. I set up a business in 2004 called Henderson Maxwell, which I'm still running today. And at that point in time, it was just me and a desk and I was going around doing presentations at retirement expos, uh, what was the money show at the time and also the investment expo uh, back in the day. And you know, that public speaking or becoming an expert strategy that I kicked off early in the piece really precipitated the client base that I've got today. So that was really, I suppose, the catalyst for growing the business and uh, for getting to where I am today. I did a couple of acquisitions along the way, uh, for better or for worse. We did a great one. We did a terrible one and, uh, you know, got my fingers burnt, but also made a bit of money with the, the, um, the one that I did in Melbourne and that was great. But by the same token, I, I think I'd probably stay focused on being an organic growth business now. and. Um, you know, we've, we've done fairly well to bring us up to practice of the year last weekend, which was great. And yeah. um, I suppose one of the biggest changes to the career was um, writing a book, which I did in 2011. I uh, wrote my first book, uh, Financial Planning DIY, which was published through John Wiley and Sons. Um, and that was really the thing yeah. that the media are interested. And I think for anyone that wants to be an expert, writing a book is probably the first step. Okay. Awesome. So, look, I'm really keen to explore this, uh, the practice of the year stuff. But, but firstly, because um, I know we sort of had a bit of a chat about this before, but 
So you talked about writing this book in 2011, but I know that you 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 sort of jumped into it, um, like you say, doing those retirement expo talks and setting yourself up as an expert actually way before you got to that point. So can you give us a bit of a storyline there and, and maybe some you know ideas for, for someone else that was looking to, to sort of position themselves in that way? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I've read every management book under the sun and then I started looking at the financial planning industry and accounting industry and those people that were really successful were those that were fairly well known and who were in fact experts and set them up, you know, in a position of trust and they become a voice of trust for the particular industry in which they specialize. And you look at people like say John McGrath, who wrote a great book years ago called you Inc. Uh, and that was one of my forms of motivation. And uh, Dina Katz was an American author uh, who I also followed and uh, she was sensational. And, you know, again, setting herself up as an expert and uh, I suppose setting yourself up as an expert also leads you on to making sure that if you ever get asked a question that you'll always either know the answer or you'll be able to find out the answer. You don't yeah, have to yeah. know it. Yeah, yeah. You know, they're only human. But, uh, but by the same uh, time, you can go away and find the answer. Find the answer. You'll, find it. You'll, you'll become better and better educated, better educated in uh, whatever uh, area, area you're in. For me, right, the book right. was really an extra really in that. But when I started the business, I started the business uh, one of my key strategies key was to become an expert. expert. And I wrote that down in my first point. Uh, is that sound reverberating or is it just nice? Yeah, it's we're just, just we're just caught we're just caught back there. Yeah, I'm copying a bit of latency yeah, issues. It's all yeah, good, let's push on. Hopefully we can push through this one. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so tell us, so one of the profile, how did you go about like, starting off on that first step and getting into the presentations with your time and expos? Uh, well, it's the same as uh, becoming an expert. You literally just pick up the phone and start speaking to the organisers. You, uh, Someone's Jenny Brown just said, perhaps Phil uh, mute his mic. I'm not sure that's one of the issues there, Phil, but uh, maybe there's some feedback from the mics there. So there you go. Um, Listen, uh, jump on the phone. That's, that's really the key is, is talk, to, uh, talk to the organisers of these things. There we go. It's all fixed. Uh, talk to the organisers of these things. Talk to the journos. Um, you know, you, you see all these articles in the newspaper every day and I can assure you that the, the journos are aching for experts and they need different experts. They don't need me every time they've got a story. That's boring as anything. So what they want to do is actually get a bit of diversity and they want to find new people, younger people, people in... Uh, um, uh, people, I suppose, in, in niche markets, in diverse markets, so whether you specialise in advice for women, specialise in Gen X advice, Gen Y advice, fee-for-service advice, um, they, they're looking for people in all niches. So get in contact with the journos and if you see a, uh, you know, an expo or something that's on, those organisers are also looking for diversity of speakers. With, you know, they might have someone in aged care, they might have someone in uh, uh, in finance, but they might want someone to do a talk on, um, you know, Centrelink or something like that as well. So depending on what your expertise is, no doubt there's there's a way that you can leverage that uh, to a much greater degree than what you're probably already doing at the moment. And the internet lends itself to doing exactly that. There's so many niche markets. Now, we ran a webinar yesterday and had 500 people register. We only had a 500 uh, limit on it as well, which we hit just before we kicked off. Um, but looking away from that, I realised, hey, we should maybe be doing webinars just for SMSF uh, trustees. Maybe we should be doing one just for Centrelink uh, recipients and the changes that are going to come in on the 1st of January. And maybe we should be doing one for people that have industry super funds and actually breaking out into other niches. And, and the same yeah. goes for journalism and for becoming an expert. People are looking for experts in different areas. Okay. And so did you, when you first started, did you pick a, a, a particular topic or area that you wanted to speak on or is that something that you've sort of learned over time uh, to get more specific? Uh, listen, I, I suppose I went for the area where I could add the most value and the area where uh, it would add, add the most value to me as well. So uh, for me, that was retirement. At the point in time where I kicked off my business, I just left Tyne and McKenzie, who were uh, bought out by IPAC and AXA and all the rest of them, and they were specialising in retirement. So I was trained in that area. So what I did find, of course, is that in retirement, you can reduce people's 
tax uh, substantially. You can reduce the capital gains tax that they pay from the sale of a business, uh, and you can put them into account-based pensions, which are entirely tax-free to give them an income for life. So, you know, those areas add huge value to people's lives, and it's also an area that people don't know and understand. So, even though a lot of advisors are focused on retirement, I don't think they do it well, and they don't express their value well enough. And that was really the point of becoming an expert and helping people understand that they can live a tax-free retirement. Hopefully, that'll be able to continue with the super changes more recently, but uh, who knows. But nevertheless, that, that's an area that I chose. Um, it's also uh, economically viable or commercially viable as a business model because you get funds under management. We charge a fee uh, of uh, funds under management. So obviously, uh, you know, up around 200 million, which is where we're sitting at the moment, a little bit under that at the moment, um, then, you know, we can run a pretty good business in, in a profitable fashion and give great advice and have clients for life. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think that's, uh, that's great tips. Um, okay, so tell us a bit, a bit more about this. Obviously, the, the practice of the year and the, the AFA, that's all just sort of happened recently. Tell us a bit about that, that process and, and maybe, I know that obviously they, that's a pretty rigorous process and they look at all areas of your business, but what were the, the areas that you thought set your business apart from some of the other guys out there, which I know were also of a very high standard? Yeah, I'm, I'm a bit surprised the AFA didn't put me on a treadmill with all the ECG things all over me because I tell you what, it's a pretty arduous process. You know, most of these competitions that we all enter and, uh, you know, I've been doing this for years, I suppose, and it's all part of building credibility is, is entering competitions um, for advice. I, I didn't realise how arduous it actually was, but they literally come in and they, they interview the staff, they go through the financials. Uh, they send out a survey to all of your clients, which I found incredibly invasive and fairly challenging, I've got to say, because I, whilst I'd done little surveys on, on webinars and things like that in the past, which is to a fairly engaged audience, I wasn't quite sure how the clients were going to respond. But fortunately, it was, uh, was fairly positive. But I must say I was a little bit nervous in going through that process. Um, yeah. I suppose one of, one of the things that probably stood out uh, with Henderson Maxwell was our media profile. And it's not just mine. Tony Davison, uh, who's got a, a small portion of the business as well, uh, is pretty active on Sky Business. In fact, he spends about five or six uh, hours a week on Sky. And I've sort of handballed him a couple of articles for um, uh, The Australian and also uh, The Finn Review, which he does uh, every three weeks. So, you know, he's pretty active as well. And, you know, that, that activity, we don't necessarily get paid for and we don't get a massive commercial return on it, but it does give you credibility. And that, again, is probably what the guys from the AFA were looking at. Um, but it's, uh, it, it, it's fairly confronting for someone to go through your business like they did with us. And, uh, you know, even with the, um, uh, the, the, the profile that we have or the perceived profile that we have, you know, we don't have a massive business. We, we've got to you know, turn over a little bit under four million bucks and, you know, we run a 40% profit, which is great. But, um, you know, it, it, it's bloody hard work, even, even though we've got the profile and the phone rings, you know, several times a day for prospective new clients. There's a lot yeah. of work that we've got to do. And, you know, we use, I suppose, the art of reciprocation to, to build the business. We give away a lot of free stuff to try to get uh, the, you know, five or 10% of people that might be wanting to become clients. And hopefully the AFA picked up on that. And that's something that I really wanted to press home to them is even though we've got a media, media profile, we absolutely work our asses off to get to where we are. And, you know, we, I think, uh, um, uh, you know, it was mentioned earlier that uh, by Phil, I think that, you know, we must have 30 hour ducks. We work, really long hours and it's nice I suppose to have that recognition from the AFA to say you know great you know you're a best practice business but yeah. you know what I can say is that we work fairly hard to get to that point and uh, despite the fact we've got a media profile we don't have clients with you know multi-billions of dollars walking through the door every day so yeah. you know the AFA were probably looking for the rate of growth which was probably around 15 to 20 percent for the practice uh, as well as the diversity that we've got in terms of the accounting business, which has grown uh, by about 25%. And uh, the accounting business specialises in SMSFs, and we look after about just under 250 SMSFs at the moment. So uh -huh. um, that's grown from, I think, what was only 40 uh, three years ago. So it's been pretty rapid sort of growth for the accounting business as well. 
Um, So I think they're the sorts of things that they're looking for, looking for growth, looking for, you know, media profile and uh, also looking for the, you know, the profitability and the ratios uh, that that sit on the uh, the P&L. Okay. Interesting. And so how did you go about, because you've, you've, so you've got your financial planning arm of your business, you do a lot of funds management work um, and then you've, you've got the accounting side. What's, what was the evolution there? And, um, for someone that might be looking to to sort of grow their business or bolt on additional services, what what are you what are your tips on the on the right sort of approach there? Yeah, listen, uh, you got to be patient. Like I don't know, as a thirty two year old when I started out the business, I wasn't particularly patient. I think on my business plan, I wanted to be the largest retirement planning business in the country. And you know, I look back at that and think, God, you're an idiot. I really do. I was thinking, like, seriously, what were you thinking? Um, you know, and I went out there and I bought a couple of businesses and I sold a couple of little books to try to clean things up. But, you know, at the end of the day, when you buy businesses, you also take on debt, you take on risk uh, and you take on additional staff, you take on additional clients, which, which haven't bought into your philosophy from day one. Um, so whilst I did really well out of uh, buying and selling a Melbourne business and I quite enjoyed working with the staff and the clients down there, um, you know, I bought a Sydney business in 2009 and, you know, frankly, it was a bit of a disaster. Um, mm. And we probably halved the value of that over the same period of time. So one offset the other. So yeah. I, I think um, being patient is really important in terms of your evolution. Don't try to go out and buy other people's clients without thinking about how you're going to integrate them really well and make sure if you, if you are going to go down the acquisition path um, that you do your due diligence and make sure the terms and conditions are favourable to you. You know, I know it's a highly competitive market out there at the moment, so maybe that's not actually a great time to buy because you probably won't get the best conditions. Um, that being said, you know, the evolution from, say, uh, a financial advice business, I was initially licensed through Securitor, which is now owned by the uh, BT Westpac Group. Um, we were then went out and got our own licence when we were sitting at around about 60 million, I think, is funds under management. So we probably had about uh, five staff. And I was just wanting to do different things with my clients' money. I didn't want to buy managed funds, have it sitting on a platform um, and you know, be charging, you know, having the client pay 2.5% total fee that just didn't really make much sense to me so uh, we wanted to go down the accounts uh, the managed accounts path which we are now doing and have been doing for about eight years so we're probably one of the um, I suppose pioneers so to speak in that uh, in that domain and that made a lot more sense because I can own shares I can own term deposits bonds and um, you know manage funds if we want to but we tend to try to avoid managed funds and focus on ETFs so really that evolution from great from from uh, you know being under a fully licensed uh, aligned licensee yeah that move to becoming self-licensed was really important sorry for those people that are aligned to the the, the big banks but uh, I'm uh, vehemently anti uh, big banks and licensees because I do see them as product floggers. So uh, hopefully that's uh, uh, not too offensive to some, but that's certainly the way the industry is perceived, and I think it's the reality uh, for a lot of um, uh, a lot of firms. And I'm just philosophically uh, not aligned myself to that 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 uh, way of thinking. And I suppose becoming independently licensed was a really important step for me. Managing the money the way we want it to be managed. And then what I found is that most of my clients were self-managed super funds. So we then thought, well, hang on a moment. We're managing 40, 50, 60 self-managed super funds and we're giving the accounting out to accountants that are actually pretty hopeless in managing them. The average accountant manages about five self-managed super funds and we found that they clients didn't have uh, trustees that were up to date. They didn't have binding denominations just about ever. Uh, They rarely had written investment strategies that were up to date. And even today, none of them have written investment strategies that include insurance, which they must have. Um, most of them, um, most of the accountants do the audits internally, and I think best practice is having the audit done externally. So we thought, bugger it. You know, we were frustrated with financial planning and we did that ourselves. So we, we may as well just go down the accounting path. So I then went to find uh, an accountant that would be capable of managing the self-managed super funds and our clients. And uh, I set that business up as uh, 75% mine, 25% theirs. Um, And that was uh, with a girl who'd been working with IPAC. And I literally just put an ad on Seek, which I've actually found to be pretty effective over the years uh, and cheap, a very cheap way to hire staff. 
uh, of course, you've got to do your due diligence. But yeah, she was fantastic. But then she had a few family tragedies that needed to be addressed. And, you know, she changed her focus. Uh, and I then sold that 25% or she sold the 25% to Rocco, uh, who is now our accountant. He won Partner of the Year at uh, the Australian Accounting Awards last week, which is pretty cool. Good on him. Um, the rock star accountant. Well, I think he is anyway, but he's, uh, he's pretty cool. Um, and, uh, and he's been going great guns. So that evolution has taken place really as a drive from the clients, not necessarily um, by some sort of vertical integration that I had initially set out to establish. But that's the way it's coming out. And we are now vertically integrated. So we're self-licensed. We give the strategic advice. We're very focused on holistic advice, uh, you know, tax advice as much as the, uh, uh, you know, financial planning advice. And we don't give a lot of product advice because we use a managed account. Uh, and that sort of takes away or removes that alignment to, to a particular product provider. Um, and we're agnostic with respect to platform. If people don't want to use a managed account, no worries. We'll use um, BT, Asgard, um, Macquarie, uh, whatever. We don't really care. We don't get paid by them anyway. And uh, we really just want the cheapest and best option for the client. And, you know, even yeah. now we're looking around at other managed account options. So the evolution just takes place over time. It's just one of those things, you know, you, you, uh, you cats out there, you, you just want everything all at once or, or you uh, want a lifestyle or, you know, we, we all want different things. And I think you've just got to be patient. That's really the key, but try to try to establish some direction with a written plan from day one. That's always the key. Yeah. No, I think that's good advice. Cause I think a lot of people, you, you know, you get caught up in you trying to build out this business, but letting it evolve naturally from the needs of your clients makes a lot of sense so some yeah, well, great they, they pay your bills <laughs> they, they uh, um yeah. so you know you gotta look after them. you gotta love them to death awesome cool well look i could uh, i could keep asking you questions all day but i know that uh that phil's got a got a few for you as well so i'm going to turn it over to him in a sec just before i do though for anyone watching you know i see that a few people are typing in questions if anyone else has got questions so sam feel free to type them into the chat box on the side and we're going to get to them uh, in 10 minutes or so. Right, so I'm unmuting myself. Let's hope that we don't get some audio issues again. Uh, Sam, I love the openness that, uh, about your business. Uh, and, you know, we, every day we talk about money with our clients, but it's funny that financial advisors seem to be a bit cagey about their own business financials. Um, so just to kind of openly talk about, you know, you're turning over four mil, 40% profit margins. Um, it's, it's really great to kind of hear that openness and, so we can kind of, people can compare to where you're at. And um, so thank you for kind of being willing to share. Uh, my first question is, given that you started back in 2004, uh, you, you did seminars and, and um, you were speaking at conferences, uh, retirement conferences and stuff. Do you think that's still the best way for someone to build out their personal brand? Oh, no, not really. I mean, I've, I've been doing the retirement expo for about, 10, 11 years now, and we've just dropped it. So uh, we did find that we were getting deteriorating um, returns on those, those sorts of events. Um, you know, the, the way you advertise and the way you market these days has changed substantially. You used to be able to put an ad on the telly or an ad in the newspaper and you'd get a, a huge number of responses with the media the way that it is today. It, it's so diversified. Like TV is still a massive medium. You know, we hear that the internet's taking over and that's fine. It, it is. It's certainly biting into TV, but TV gives you an instant mass market. And uh, it, it's still one of the best ways to advertise. But if you're just starting out in an advice business, you're not going to have a one and a half million dollar advertising campaign. So what, what I'm now seeing is the ability for people to uh, embrace technology as best they possibly can. And obviously, you know, most of the XY advisors or the advisors watching this have already embraced technology, which is great. But I think we still need to take it a whole lot further. And that's probably where the future of the, the business and the future of leads lies. I don't think it really lies in mass media because it's not accessible to everybody in terms of cost. We've been running some TV ads over the last few weeks and, you know, we've had plenty of downloads on what I call our, our lead magnet, which is uh, you know, 15 strategies to reduce your tax and boost your super. Um, you know, I think we've had 12, 1300 or 1400 downloads on that, which has been great. But, you know, how much of those, how many of those people actually just want free information? Yeah. And, and I suppose this is the problem. And, and it, it's just about creating a sales funnel, no matter what your medium is, whether it's Facebook advertising, whether it's LinkedIn, whether it's uh, 
TV, newspaper, or whether it's just through niche advertising, you know, if you're in the medical game or whatever, whether you're going to conferences and things like that. Um, you know, as I mentioned at the start of this, we ran a webinar uh, which we'd advertised uh, publicly. We, we did Facebook advertising for it. And we also used our database, which is sitting at about six and a half, seven thousand people now. Uh, and that's probably our best asset is the database. So I'd encourage people to, um, you know, you've got to have, you know, a, a, at least a weekly newsletter. Um, don't, don't just do a monthly newsletter. It's not frequent enough. People's inboxes are getting hammered by everybody else. And if you want to be the expert, you want to be the front and centre, you probably need to be in the inbox at least once a week in one, one way, shape or form. Um, so, you know, we've moved a long way from standing up at the Retirement Expo, the Investment Expo, which no longer exists, or the, the Marnie Show back in the day, to, you know, really having to embrace technology to, I suppose, diversify the way we bring in leads. Mm. Um, the, the best lead magnet we've got, of course, is the TV show on Sky News Business. It's on at uh, eight o'clock every Thursday night. It's called Your Money, Your Call. Um, and people who are specific to our demographic uh, ring in and they ask questions about super and retirement. So I've been doing that for about four and a half years now. And, you know, it's definitely the best uh, form of lead attraction. But by the same token, it took me sort of 18 months, two years to be getting a decent amount of leads from that simply because people have to learn to trust you. They don't just trust you because you, you know, you got your picture in the paper or, or you write an article. They learn to trust you over time and they test you, I suppose, with the consistency of what you say. Uh, and that's where that weekly newsletter for those people starting out, you know, whether you've got a database of five or 10 or, or 500 or a thousand, and you can grow that through Facebook, LinkedIn or whatever. Um, you know, you, you've really got to make sure that you're front and centre and that the news and information you're providing is of value and it's consistent and it's aligned to your personal and corporate values as well. Yeah. So uh, just ask your question just about TV. Do you, you obviously track the leads that come predominantly from TV? How many leads would you get into the business um, from the work that you're doing? Uh, last year, I think we had about a 1,000. Okay. So uh, it, it sounds crazy. Uh, out of that, we probably, now that, that's some people just ringing up for free info. Like they just, hey, I'm setting up a transition to retirement. Um, uh, you know, how much tax am I going to pay? Or is it worth me doing that? Um, you know, we, we're not running um, a benevolent society. So by the same token that we get all these calls, we've got to try to filter them in some way, shape or form that doesn't take up all of our resources. Mm. You know, we have, uh, how many staff we got? 12, 13 staff. Um, so, you know, we, we've got limited resources to manage all of those leads. So we've got scripts on how to manage them mm. um, and how to, I suppose, uh, divert those people that just want free questions answered to the show or to the um, uh, column that I do in the Fin Review every weekend. Um, for those people that sort of go on to the next level, then either Tony or myself, we've only got two advisors, which surprises a lot of people. We, I'm not in the business of having eight advisors and, you know, having one of those businesses that just looks big on, on the surface. Um, we, we want to run an efficient business. So Tony and I literally jump on the phone and talk to the clients and, and qualify them. That qualification process is really important. And if we can't help them, then we tell them. And if we can help them um, without them having to pay anything, then we do that as well. We'll literally just give them a, an honest answer and say, you know what, you, you, uh, you probably just need to do this or you need to do that. But, you know, go and seek advice. And this is generally nature and all the rest of the disclaimers that we have. Um, and then, you know, there's a small portion that would actually fit the sort of client that we want to work with. And, you know, when we uh, have that discussion with a, a prospective client, we say, listen, we, we just need to have a bit of a chat to work out whether we're right for you and you're right for us. And, and that's really important when you're building a business, because at some point in time, you're going to look back and you, you don't want to have a business full of people that just fog a mirror. Uh, just because they breathe doesn't mean they can be a client. Mm. Um, you know, it's important to be able to articulate what your ideal client looks like. And that's been very important for me um, throughout the, uh, the the growth process. That being said, I have taken on, you know, sometimes I'll take on smaller clients just because I like them. <laughs> you know, it's not all about money. Uh, sometimes it's, um, you know, we, we, we just want to take on clients because their situation's challenging. They might be in a, a position where they, they probably can't, necessarily afford great advice but they they deserve it or they need it so you know we like to to help out as well i've got a young bloke up in uh, the northern territory at the moment that just rang me and um you know had a bit of a chat and you know i thought hey he's a good bloke 
You know, he's, he's a good bloke that's just trying to get good advice and he's mm. struggling. And, you know, I just want to spend some time with him and, you know, add some value. So, uh, you know, that, that qualification process is really important. Uh, and that sort of leads on to the quality of the business that you're going to end up with. And, you know, it, it's a journey. Yeah. So uh, out of that thousand leads, how many turned into clients after, after it trickled through the whole process? Would you... Uh, we probably bring on about 50 or 60 new clients a year in some way, shape or form. So not all of those will be um, uh, full funds under management advice clients. We probably bring on, uh, what, 30, 30 odd million a year in funds under management. So it's decent, decent sort of level. Mm. Um, and our client base, I suppose our target client is what I call a mass affluent. So it's 500,000 to 5 million. We don't have anyone greater than that. We're not in the, the ultra high net worth market, but you know, if they've got under 500, generally we won't take them on. Um, we've got a few with, with a bit less, but uh, we tend to uh, attract the self-managed super fund clients as well. Your average self-managed super fund has about a million and 50 in it. So that's kind of where my average client sits. Yeah, yeah. And, and so to that point, uh, Ray uh, um, had a question about bringing on 30 to 40 year old clients if they don't, because you're charging a farm, uh, if they don't have, or if they've got less than 500,000, it's kind of, you'll kind of push them towards another advisor who will better service them. Is that how you manage it? Uh, yeah, listen, I've been taking on more 30 to 40 year olds lately, just because I enjoy um, giving advice to them. It's just different to the retirement market. They, they really need advice. They don't necessarily take it well. I actually find that um, the 30 and 40 year olds are actually quite difficult to deal with because they're so <laughs> bloody busy. Um, they're usually geared to the eyeballs. They've usually got kids at school. They're trying to work. Um, some of them are breaking up with their missus. Like it's just a frigging mess. Um, it's just like my life. <laughs> so it's, uh, it, it, um, it's complex. And, but you can add a lot of value if you become that valued voice for them. And that's what I really enjoy. You know, professionally, you want to be valued by your clients. And, uh, you know, not all of my clients are retirees. And that's an important point to make. Yeah, no, great. All right. So we're going to, we're, we're almost running over time. So we're going to start heading to some audience questions. Ben, you're going to hit us with the first question. You're on mute, Ben. Sorry. Thank you, Phil. Um, yeah, I've got a great question here from Shane Hayes. Um, and, and the question is like, how do you see your practice potentially changing over the next three years? Like, is there any things that you're thinking about doing differently from what you've been doing to get you to this point? Um, I, I was just looking at that question. Uh, you know, do, do we align with accountants? Every accountant that I've ever spoken to just says that they get hounded by financial planners wanting to align with them. Now, I know a lot of advisors have aligned quite successfully with accountants and that's great, but I've not been able to do that. Um, what I find is that there tends to be a conflict of interest when it comes to sharing clients. So we tend to be a little bit protective over our clients and that's why we've gone down the path of vertical integration. Um, it, it's, it's the reason why you also need to own your database of clients. Uh, and, and that's, you know, it leads to the whole way you market your business and, and who's talking to your client because you want to make sure that they're, they're trusted advisors. So if you're going to align with an accountant, make sure you've got something greater than just a, an agreement, even if it's a written agreement. Um, you, you want to be able to share their values, you want to be able to share their philosophy, understand what their, their specialisations are. And, uh, and just make sure that, that, is, that the best practice advice is coming out of those people to your clients. Uh, and I just struggle to find that uh, with accountants, even with estate planners. I, I use an estate planner now, uh, Retire Law in North Sydney, and he's really good. He's been doing my personal stuff and my client stuff for years. Um, but, you know, finding those sorts of people is a bit of a challenge. And uh, it also comes down to that client ownership issue that I've had for, for many years. So who are we going to align with in the future? Who knows? Well, hopefully no one. That's kind of... <laughs> I'm a very disgusting person when it comes to good advice. Uh, so, you know, if you can align with someone um, in a trustworthy fashion, great. But we've not really been able to do it well, which is why we've gone out and, you know, we manage our own clients' money. We have our own accountancy firm. Um, and we do align, I suppose, with an estate planner. That's about it. Yeah, so basically you don't trust anyone, which is good. <laughs> <laughs> so Mark Rottenstein's asked a question uh, about the AFA award. Um, considering there was a lot of time, effort involved, uh, do you think it was worthwhile or was it more of that kind of uh, just that building trust with clients? 
Uh, I don't know whether it's worthwhile yet. I suppose we'll find out over the next uh, 12 months or so. I believe it's a fairly arduous journey. I've been told by previous winners that you uh, you need to give up a, a few weeks or a few months of your life to go and travel on the road and talk to other advisors. But I don't mind doing that sort of stuff. I think that's great. Um, I quite like talking with other advisors and, and helping them with their businesses, which is why um, you know I'm quite open with with my business and I think that's really important because what you do find is most people don't do what you say that you do anyway, uh, even though they probably should. You know, I used to, I was obsessed by um, business people, successful business people and what they did and how they did it. And I would always go and meet with them and find out who won the awards and why. Um, and I think that sense of curiosity, just like Nashi did when he first got in contact with me, he was all over me. And, uh, you know, I think that, that's great. That's, that's good. And you know, Corey Russell did the same thing, another one of you, your guys. And, uh, yeah, that, that's great. That, that's exactly what I did, which is why, you know, I'd spend a bit of time uh, doing that with other people that, that, are, that are curious. you just got to stay curious and, and find out what others are doing. You don't have to invent the wheel. You just have to do what others are doing and do it better. 100%. I'm all about copying everyone else. I just, <laughs> yeah. everyone else is so much better than I am. So just, I just steal their ideas. Yeah, totally. <laughs> um, one question, this is from Shane Hayes as well. Like what, just in terms of in outside of the alignment piece, are there things that you're thinking that you'll be doing differently in three years time to what you're doing now, just in terms of like your client engagement and the way that you're working with clients or the way that you're managing your business? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, even the even the way we're doing this interview. Five years ago, you would never be able to interview on Zoom because no one had ever heard of Zoom. Um, you know, here we are, five years later, being able to do a group chat. You know, in front of uh, you know what will probably be a hundred odd people, which is sensational. So, you know, we've got clients because of the nature of the TV show we do. We've got clients in the Northern Territory, North Queensland, WA, uh, and we speak to a lot of them either on Zoom or Skype or even over the phone. So. The way we do business uh, and the way we make ourselves accessible to our clients is essential to our success. Um, and the way I suppose we distribute our advice or the channel to which we distribute our advice uh, needs to embrace technology. We need to embrace change. And, you know, as a, a future advisor, we're going to need to, and we always have embraced innovation. And I'd like to think that we've always been at the forefront of that. Um, and, and, you know, we're always learning. You, ne you can never think that you know everything. You never get arrogant enough that you know everything, whether it's about retirement planning, superannuation, or how to run a business. And you know, I'm just as fascinated about how to run a business as I am about giving superannuation advice. You know, we just went over to FinCon uh, over in the US with a, a bunch of other advisors that I met over there, had a great time, learned a bunch of new stuff. Uh, I'm obsessed by podcasts. I listen to Amy Porterfield every week when she puts out a new podcast. I listen to uh, Pat Flynn, uh, Smart Passive income um, you know I'm, I'm still obsessed but probably less so by books uh, so we're always always trying to push the boundaries I suppose of innovation and that comes down to how you deliver that advice to clients I love it we've got we've got two more questions from what I can see um, try and do a quick fire do you charge for your first appointment uh, no we don't no, we do a free first appointment we've thought about charging for it um, you know we, we do okay we probably don't need to it might be a good opportunity for qualification um it's probably something we should do uh but we haven't <laughs> yeah. and um and leon jones has asked was it difficult to establish to establish a managed account no it's really easy to establish a managed account um in the first instance but it depends how much how, how engaged you are in the investment process mm -hmm. i mean you know i've been managing shares since I was a young bloke. My old man used to have a family trust and used to distribute money to me pre-99 when you were able to do those sorts of things. So as a kid, I thought I owned BHP shares, even though they were dads. Uh, I certainly took uh, took ownership of them at an early stage and they ended up uh, you know, helping me buy a hotted up car. But um, by the same token, it, it, you know, I, I got quite a lot of insight into how to manage money and uh, that's been really important. So it depends how engaged you are with that process. If you can manage a share portfolio, uh, you know, a balanced portfolio with shares and cash and bonds and, and all the rest of it, then yeah, managed accounts, pretty easy to establish. Um, that being said, you'll have to jump through a few compliance hoops. Uh, so whether you're using, we use managedaccounts.com.au at the moment, we're looking at Hub24, we've looked at a bunch of others, um, and we'll continue to look at those managed account providers to make sure that the ones that we use are leaders in their field. And uh, you know we we may well change in the not too distant future. Right, I 
this interview has been fantastic. Um, if someone wants to uh, get in touch with you, what's the best way that they can do it? Uh, I suppose through our, our website at hendersonmaxwell.com.au. Um, we are looking at doing some advisor education in the future. So I'm just toying with an idea around uh, Advisor You, which will be about educating advisors around building and growing their businesses, making them more profitable. Uh, and uh, apart from that, they can, uh, they can ring us, email us, follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, Facebook, all those usual sorts yeah. of places. So if anyone's got any questions about acquisitions, writing a book, speaking, um, how to get your profitability up to 40%, uh, how to get, you know, 1,200 downloads from an ebook from TV advertisement. Mate, you, you're covering every base. So if anyone's got any questions, go hit up Sam. And we're finishing now, so I just want to thank you so much, Sam, for coming on board and kind of just uh, giving us all your information and, and, and also not being caging, just freely giving it out. So thank you very much. Yeah, you guys really enjoy it. Happy to help out and, um, yeah, look forward to doing it again one day. Will do. And, and as you know, Sam, we've got, a, we've got a great crew of young advisors. If you want to get anyone on uh, your money, your call, just hit us up. Maybe not Ben, <laughs> he looks like a homeless man, or me because I look like I'm 12. Uh, but we've got uh, a Benny, huge... Benny the bush has already hit me up, mate. So uh, stay tuned. I think he's due to uh, come on in November sometime. Is that right, Who's this? Nashi. Oh, Nashi. Yeah, oh, no. The homeless man. Well done. <laughs> As you know, we've got, we've got a big range of younger advisors. So just hit, hit any of them up. Um, uh, so thanks again, Sam. Uh, and you. thanks for everyone for coming on board. Uh, we'll have this up online on YouTube so you can go uh, look over it again um, and just make sure you catch anything that you may have missed. Um, so keep on eye out for a fortnight's time. We've got Ian Dunbar coming and talking to us about everything fintech and what's happening in the whole fintech startup space. Um, so keep an eye out for that. So thanks, guys. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, guys. Sam. See you guys. Bye.